Scripture reading today will be 2 Samuel chapter 23, 1-7. These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, speaks. David, the man to whom God gave such wonderful success. David, the anointed of the God of Jacob. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. The rock of Israel said to me, One shall come who rules righteously, who rules in the fear of God. He shall be as the light of the morning, a cloudless sunrise, when the tender grass springs forth upon the earth, as sunshine after rain, and it is my family he has chosen. Yes, God has made an everlasting covenant with me. His agreement is eternal, final, sealed. He will constantly look after my safety and success. But the godless are as thorns to be thrown away, for they tear the hand that touches them. One must be armed to chop them down. They shall be burned. And the second is Revelation chapter 1, verses 4b to 8. Dear friends, may you have grace and peace from God who is and was and is to come and from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who faithfully reveals all truth to us. He was the first to rise from death to die no more. He is far greater than any king in all of Europe. All praise to him who always loves us and who sets us, set us free from our sins by pouring out his lifeblood for us. He has gathered us into his kingdom and made us priests of God his Father. Give to him everlasting glory. He rules forever. Amen. See, he is arriving, surrounded by clouds, and every eye shall see him. Yes, and those who pierce him. And the nations will weep in sorrow and in terror when he comes. Yes, amen. Let it be so. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Everyone have a good weekend. Uh, with, uh Turkey and family and all those great things, and now you're headed towards that that Advent Christmas focus, which we will uh, start off today with the conclusion of the church year with Christ King Sunday, the last Sunday of the Christian year. Next Sunday, we need to come in wishing each other a happy new year, because it will be the first Sunday of the church year as we begin Advent. Recycle of the church. And the purpose of the lectionary system and the cycle of the church and the seasons is to help us be immersed in God's word from beginning to end, since before time to after time. And so through the lectionary cycles and through the, the consistency of, of having Old Testament and New Testament readings and lessons throughout, we grow to a greater appreciation of who God is and how God remains just as important today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow. Christ the King Sunday is a time when we look at the coming together of all of these scriptures and all of these seasons to this final day of celebration, celebrating Christ the Lord, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, of our lives and ruler of the world. Now the imagery that comes with Christ the King Sunday is an image of kings and kingdoms. And yet that's not where we live today. Yes, we have kings and kingdoms within some of the other countries of the world, but in a majority they're more figureheads with other ruling classes. Um, that take over most of that governance. And so our minds have to drift back to the Middle Ages and before, or even the time of Jesus, when, when kings um, were the rulers of their kingdoms, rulers of their people, and there were class systems, and people knew who was going to rule because it was all within the the forming of generations, and unless the kingdom was taken over, then someone within the family would be ruling in that kingdom. 
And you pretty much know where your class status was as it um, went from the monarchy down. And so imagery would have to go back that far to, to start us to think about this, this king of kings, this lord of lords. We on the other side are actually living in a democracy. We live in a time where we have a choice of who is going to rule over us as individuals. And collectively, um, those who have the loudest voice or the most votes um, are the ones that end up being the rulers of our nation, our communities. And But the difference being between the two is we have a voice in that. So with those two in mind, um, I'm not going to say whether we're at um, a um, challenge because we don't have the visibility of kings and kingdom in our front yard. Because so often we'll put so much on Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, with a perception of what an earthly king is like, that we limit his rule. We limit his reign over the world as being a reign that is not from when he takes over in his coronation and, and until he dies. But in fact, Jesus Christ has been in rule with the Father since before the beginning of time. When God called this world into being, he was the ultimate authority. He was the ruler of all. And he called this world into being and created all of creation and ourselves and placed us together. And we've watched through our scriptures and our sharing of lessons throughout the year of how all of that unfolded in different segments as we went through. And how the people of Israel were formed as a family. And those children of Israel became God's children. And we watched them as they moved through the pages of scripture. And we remember that at one time in that um, evolving as, as a people of God, they looked around and saw that all the neighboring nations had kings. And they felt that if only they had a king, then everything would be all right. And so they petitioned God for a king. And God said, you know what, you're not ready for a king yet. But they kept pushing and pushing and pushing until finally... God gave him Saul. But Saul was not the anointed king that, that God wanted. And the nation waited um, and watched <laughs> as Saul did not live up to the expectations of the people. And it was through David that the true kingdom of God was established. And we heard within his words um, today that Kathy shared that he was the family, he was the head of the family that was put into covenant with God, that he would, through this family, provide a rule for God's people to eternity. Now, this says that it's the last words of David, and in several places within scripture we see those same words. So we're not really sure if these were actually the last words, because they surface different last words in other places. But you can see that he's trying to say to them, um, his, his family, his nation, that they were special. That they were God's nation. They were God's children. That he had purposely focused in on them and their righteousness and their opportunity to follow in his way through the leadership of this royal um, covenant. Now, as we look at our Old Testament history, we know that in the line of David, there were righteous and there were unrighteous kings. We all look at our families. There are ones that follow the way the family would like them to, and there are those that don't. But they are all in the family. And God did not completely blight out the children of Israel just because, and Judah, because of uh, what they have done in the past. But he found ways to bring them back. And if you look in the Old Testament and you read, um, especially as you read through the children of Israel as they went through the time of the judges, you'll see that that um, they go into an upswing where they're, they're righteous and they have a righteous king. And then all of a sudden something happens and a new king comes in and they go into unrighteousness. 
and and a, a judge comes and brings them back into righteousness, righteous king. And so you see this momentum going on throughout uh, the Old Testament. And through it all, God stayed true to his covenant. And he was with the people of God through all of this, even in captivity, as we talked about last Sunday. And through that, that exile, through that captivity, he remained faithful and with that voice saying, there will be a time when the deliverer will come. There will be a time when you once again will come to the place that is familiar to you. And so now we fast forward. We watch this line of David and this monarchy keeping these people, these remnant of God's children together, and they come to a time of Jesus. And now we see kings and kingdoms in the earthly world pushing in against the Jewish tradition, pushing in against the way of life that they've had, and the people themselves are rebelling against their own faith as well as upon the government. And God finds a time for himself to come. And he comes as Emmanuel, God with us. He comes into the midst of all of this uncertainty in Jesus Christ. And for three years, God walks upon this earth as Jesus. He teaches. He performs signs of miracles. He heals. He exercises demons. He takes each individual as their sacred worth, whether they be part of the Jewish tradition or Gentile that's ostracized from the community. He enters into their lives and he brings them the word and the power and the mercy of God. And through those three years, people begin seeing that perhaps in him there is the king, there is the Messiah that was promised through the line of David. Perhaps he is the anointed one. Perhaps he is the Messiah. And so this starts generating throughout the crowds and through the people of the temple who begin to say, he is not the Messiah. The Messiah is not the one to come. He, he's not the one that was promised. And we see this among the people saying, he is our Messiah. We were, we're giving him our allegiance. We're following him. We're listening to him. And then you have the Roman government. And you hear them saying, well, if this is a Messiah, and if this is a radical Messiah, then he could easily be a rebellion that would take over our, our government. He could be a threat. He is a threat. And in fact, it was um, believed this was the thought of Judas. And when he recognized that Jesus was not this type of, of Messiah that was going to annihilate the, Russia, the, the Romans, um, then um, he began to plot against turning Jesus over. That's a whole side there. So we have Pilate now out there listening to the Jewish people that say, you know, this man has gone against us, he's gone against you, you need to kill him. And we come to a part in, in scripture, um, which we often read during Lent, um, at a time when Pilate is questioning Jesus. And I share with you these words from John's Gospel, the 18th chapter. It says, Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you to ask me? Pilate replied, replied, I am not a Jew. Am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this reason came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. So here we see a challenge um, 
that is beginning to be um, opened up here in Scripture that is a challenge that we hold on to today. And that is the, the, the confusion between um, the physical world and the spiritual world. Because Pilate is looking at the physical threat of what Jesus might bring to his government. Jesus is there not denying he's king of the Jews, <clears throat> but he's not king of the Jews in a physical sense. But he is the Messiah, he is the king of the Jews in the spiritual sense. He is the long-awaited king that they have been waiting for throughout all this time. He is the righteous king in the line of David to take over the spiritual realm of the people. Pilate is focused one way, Jesus is focused the other. There is that, that tension between the physical and the spiritual. But we know how that turns out. Jesus is crucified. But that does not eliminate the reign of God. The reign of God that has been created at the beginning of time. The reign of God that has continued through the Davidic family. The reign of God that was made known in person through Jesus Christ. The reign of God now continues when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. Because the disciples now, who were kind of floundering where they were going to go after Jesus died, were empowered by the Holy Spirit to go forth. Now, they were, were charged to go forth and baptize in Jesus' name and call people to Jesus. That they may understand their relationship to God through Jesus Christ. Nowhere in that commissioning did we hear them say, now go out and start these house churches. Now go out and your value will be the amount of people that you can have in each of these house churches. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to bring people into the kingdom of God as it exists on the earth so that they will be part of that heavenly kingdom and sit at that heavenly banquet. And they will assist in bringing the kingdom of God alive on the earth. So our goal is not just to couple with that. Our goal is, is not, our goal is not to fill these seats. But in order to accomplish our goal of bringing God's reign alive and full focus to the people within our families and our communions, communities, we need to fill these seats in order that they can hear the witness of God through his word and through the fellowship that you share with one another. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples then went out and they brought people by the thousands in to this family of God, to be part of this reign of God, to, to help build up the, this kingdom of God on the earth. And their message got to others through the generations and generations. And two, we have people such as Mother Teresa, who was able to take those, those filthy gutters of India and use them as her pulpit and enter into the lives of the forgotten, the people who were sick, the people who were dying, and say, you are worth something. You are a valued child of God, and you are part of his reign. You are part of this glory. You are part of God's mercy. And lifts them up out of the gutter, both physically and spiritually, so that they die knowing that they are the beloved children of God. And on and on we have men and women and youth of faith that are, that are telling their stories, that are sharing their faith, and that are being part of the development brick by brick, prayer by prayer of the kingdom of God in this world. I like Christ the King Sunday because it is not an end of a church year that excites me and the beginning of new, but it is the bringing together of all that we have experienced in one year through the seasons and bringing it together for reflection and excitement. And it challenges us. It challenges us to think of some things. And so what I'd like to share with you as, as I close is, first, one thing that comes up in Scripture throughout, and we see, and is very prevalent is in our own lives, and a challenge in my life as well, is recognizing our physical lives and the demands of our physical lives, um, our schedules, um, maintaining the necessities of our lives, um, perhaps employment, um, perhaps keeping our home going, whatever those challenges are in our physical life, 
keeping our family physically together, keeping our our, our family um, moving um, as progressively forward. Those are challenges that form so much of our lives. On the other hand, we have a spiritual life, and we have given our lives to God through Jesus Christ. If we haven't, we wouldn't be sitting here this morning. And that spiritual life is enriching. That spiritual life has more power in ways than, than our physical life, and yet it's hard to weave those together so that we see them as one. Instead, we have the either and the or. We have our church presence, and we have our worldly presence. It's, it's almost like growing up, I know, and it's way out of people's minds now, but growing up, we always had to have a dress and, and tights and everything to go to church. You put on your Sunday best. The one bath was on Saturday night. And you were ready for church on Sunday, and you didn't dare go into church. I can remember my father, the first time he saw someone in jeans go to church. Oh, my goodness, you thought that they had gone in and taken down the doors of the Vatican. He was up and down that person, and yet we came to understand that we were chopping off people from coming to church that did not feel that they could dress appropriately. And so the church doors opened wide, and now we can come to church. And Kathy, you can feel wonderful. My father would have nothing to say. And I'll tell you, I'd wear my jeans if I could. But um, we don't have that limit anymore. But it was there, and there was that, that perception. So we would have our Sunday best, and then when we're out actually doing God's Word, we were in our, our jeans, we were in our overalls, and we were doing actually more than we were doing when we came to church and we were sitting pretty. So what I'm saying is that we have to find a way to weave that together. And there's different ways for different people, and we need to establish what that is, whether it's through prayer or meditation, whether that's immersing ourselves in God's Word, God's Word, being in an active discussion, being out there in service, whatever it is for you to weave that together and to intentionally look at a way as you start this new year is have that being one of your New Year's re resolutions as you start in Advent of weaving, weaving that practice together. Secondly, we need to recognize that our purpose on Earth um, sometimes is not in the same line of what God sees our purposes for. And what we do through our prayer times is try to come to a common point where we both understand each other. And our purpose is to elevate God's reign and to help others to see that reign um, in this, this world. And, um, and third, and probably the most important, is to consider do we see Jesus as our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords? Does Jesus rule over every part of our life? Do we look to him in every situation in our life? Are we able to totally have that woven presence and know that the one who is in control is not me, but it is my Savior who gives me life? So as we close out this church year, I invite you to think of those things because ultimately we look to that reign when we are all seated at that heavenly banquet. We are all there looking up to the King of Kings on the throne before us, singing, celebrating, and at peace. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we, we thank you for your words of scripture that have been passed down to us through the ages. We thank you for those words that have instructed and led men and women and youth of faith throughout those generations. We thank you for the Christian witness to the way that your word has impacted the lives of people as they have faced the joys and challenges of each day. And we look to those experiences now in our own lives as we think about ways in which your word intersects where we are at this point and leads us forward. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to look at all of these. Scripture, 
the tradition of our church, the experiences of our lives, and help us to find the pathway that you are opening up before us. Help us to look at all that is woven into that to lead us forward. For we are comfortable in knowing that you have created all, and you sustain us throughout every moment of our days. So in our darkest moment, you have given us light through your word, through your presence in others, and to, through the quiet stillness within us. And so Lord, we pray Lord, that you will move us forward as we close out this year and we begin anew. That as we start in Advent and the waiting of the Christ child, that you will help us to bring into our lives those, those words, those traditions, those experiences, that we may form a, a weave of life that enables us to both show your glory as well catch us in times of challenge. Be with us. Help us to share the message of this day with others and prepare in our hearts how we can celebrate the new year with them as well. It is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.